gang, your inner negative voice, your gremlin voice. Remember, you're not good enough. All these people have heard this speech before about me and my gremlin voice. And they don't care about that because you're going to fail. I guarantee you. Still not. That's my inner negative voice. I call him Yang, for you are not good enough. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you a speech about how I learned to negotiate with my inner negative voice, Yang, my critical voice. Here's the way I'm going to do that. I'm going to start with the early years. How did this come about? Where did it come from? Then I'm going to transition to the adult years and tell you about how that actually played out as an adult. Then I'm going to talk about the shift that came about as a part of this process. And then I'm going to conclude with how that voice sounds today. So let's start it out, the early years. I grew up in a little southeastern town called Richmondale, Ohio, in southeast Ohio. Population 298, five square miles of rural country. My family grew up on a road called Whiskey Run Road. You know what they did? They ran moonshine up and down them their hollers. Family structure. My dad was a truck, truck driver in addition to two and three other jobs to support a young family. I'll tell you about that in a moment. My mom, my older brother, myself, my two younger sisters. I remember living in a trailer that was no bigger than two car lots. No running water, outhouse. Here's what we actually had to do for my mom to bathe us. She'd go to the well, she'd get some water, put it in the pump, the prime of the pump in the well, take all the water in the buckets, put it in these big pans on the gas stove, heat it up, and then we had this big metal gray wash tub where my mom would individually wash my family. And all on that whiskey run road, it was family. My mom, imagine this, imagine not having running water and my mom being 23 years old, taking care of a five-year-old, four-year-old, three-year-old, two-year-old, and one. That's how she did it. And that's what we did. My, my, mom, my dad's family actually lived on that road. He was one of 13 kids, farming community. And I look back on that, it was fun. We'd play hide and seek, play out in the field, go hunting, all those different things. But it was country. It was country. Now I want to talk a little bit about where we moved to after that. Another small town, probably 300 people, called Masseyville, Ohio. <laughs> on the way down Route 23, just south of Chillicothe, on the way to Waverly. Masseyville, what I remember there. Going there in the second grade. And I remember all the great experiences that I had second through sixth grade. And one moment stands out. In the sixth grade, after a game of exhilarating kickball, I remember going back and writing down in class all of my best friends. And I had like 20 names on there of my best friends in Massey. And I looked at that list, I said, you know what? None of those people look like me. None of those people look like me. And I remember saying to myself, man, I wish some African-American family would move into Masseyville, Ohio, so I'd have a black best friend. Somebody that I could relate to. Then I want to transition to uh, transition to another story about my mom's family. My mom's family grew up in Chillicothe, Ohio. 25,000 people. It was the city. Mom grew up on a street called Mechanic Street. And it was right behind the projects. They lived in the hood. When I was playing there, everybody in that neighborhood looked like me. We'd go out and play kickball and baseball and football right in that one-way street on McKinney Street. Had a great time. And I remember in junior high, 
It's the seventh grade. And I remember I couldn't take the bus back to, to Massyville. So I had to walk to my grandmother's house, which was probably two or three miles from the junior high. And I remember walking back with the, the kid from the hood, the black kid that looked like me. And I was walking back with like 10 or 12 kids from the South End, is what we called it. Walking back with them, it was a nice day. And I remember Duchess Scott said, ooh, Trace, you got girl legs. Ooh, Trace, you look funny. I was like, what is going on here? Because I wasn't good enough to fit in with the black kid us out there. I remember that vividly. And think about that. That was in 1974. That was 38 years ago. I was 13 years old. And I still remember that to this day. Another voice that came up. I always played baseball all through Midget League, Pony League, American <laughs> Legion. And I was a pretty good player. I actually made the all-star team for Midget League, which is 9 through 12 years old. Made the All-Star team. Great accomplishment. Now, I remember it was the seventh inning, bottom of the seventh inning, tied up. I was the third person to bat that inning. <clears throat> and I remember they, the, the other team made a pitching change. And they changed it to Mark Evans. And I was watching Mark Evans throw that ball, and it looked like he was throwing it 100 miles an hour. He looked like Nolan Ryan throwing that ball. And I remember sitting down on the bench, and I said to my assistant coach, I don't want to go bad against him. I'm scared. So the assistant coach tells the coach, OK, Tracy, you don't want to bat. Randy Hummel, come on, go back for Tracy. And then I remember up in the stands, all the people were saying, what's wrong with Tracy? What's wrong with Tracy? I was scared. I remember going home and just crying profusely on the bed. And my mom and dad were trying to console me because I wasn't good enough to bat against early voice. Now let's transition to the adult years. And one of the significant events for me was in 2007, I was promoted to the director of the undergraduate coaching program. My boss came to me and said, hey, Trace, I want you to create an undergraduate coaching program. I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? I had already been through an MBA program and had my executive coaching as a focus in the MBA. But I was still had all those voices. Trace, your country, you're not professional enough. Trace, you're not good enough because you don't fit in. Trace, you're not good enough because you're not credible enough. Trace, you're not good enough. Just like that all-star game, you're not good enough, is what my voice said at that time. So I remember actually setting up the training. Some of you will remember the training that I set up to practice this program, the training of this program to all the academic advisors. And I remember this voice having a great time with me. It's like, they're not going to like it. The academic advisors aren't going to like it. Trace, you're still not good enough. And I remember writing out everything that I was going to say. And I had it in pocket protectors just like this. And I scripted the whole thing. And I stayed right there behind that lectern because I was scared to get out here because of that voice. People would judge me. And then I said, I've got to change this. What can I do to change this? Because I couldn't live in this fear and doubt the rest of my life. 